Hi, everybody. My name is Charlotte Acosta. I'm the Director of Education at the Dallas Holocaust and Human Rights Museum. Um, before we get started, I just wanted to walk you through some of the guidelines for today for our lecture. Um, uh, we do have the mute all button activated on the session today, so I'm going to ask you please to stay muted at all times. This is to keep the back no noise ground uh, away. We will be running the um, Q&A and uh, questions uh, through our chat. Uh, you can find that chat button on the bottom right corner of your screen. If you tap that, it will open up the chat box and you can follow um, chats in there and you can ask any questions. Um, um, uh, so uh, I have that chat box open uh, during my lecture as well, so um, I can easily follow that. So if you have any questions, um, I'll, I'll try my best as fast as possible uh, to answer them as we're going. Uh, so you are welcome during the lecture to ask any questions in that chat function. Um, do we remember that others might be able to see you if your video is on? I have spotlighted the video on me. Uh, so that should make it a little bit easier as we are going. Um, uh, uh, please, um, again, in the chat, if there's any issues, please let uh, put that in there as well. Uh, one of my co-hosts, uh, Spencer Cronin, our uh, programs coordinator, is in here as well. He might be able to help you as well as we're going through the program. And then um, uh, sometimes if you have a bad connection, it does help to turn your camera on and might smooth that connection to a uh, Zoom meeting to the virtual meeting and make it a little smoother. So, um, so we'll uh, get started with that. Um, let me pull up my presentation. Uh, so today we are going to be talking about uh, the 10 stages of genocide. This is an evolution from our presentation that we also do with students uh, called Confronting Genocide, um, Is It Inevitable? It's one of our classroom programs that we do at the museum. So uh, before we get started really into the concept of the 10 stages of genocide itself, uh, I want to talk a little bit why it's so important to our museum. At the museum in our human rights wing, uh, we have a whole gallery dedicated to the 10 stages of genocide. Um, it reviews uh, the concept of the 10 stages and then has um, um, uh, artistic installations uh, that describe a genocide and highlight uh, each one of the 10 stages within that genocide. Uh, so this is why uh, genocide studies and the study of the 10 stages is really important to us as a museum. But before we can really delve into the 10 stages themselves, I wanted to have a really quick glimpse on the concept of genocide uh, itself. And again, if you have any questions, please feel free. You can uh, ask them in uh, the chat uh, box uh, below. Uh, but the concept of, the, of genocide uh, is a very modern concept within, if we look at all of uh, world history. Uh, really, the first delvings of uh, discussions on the concept, not the term yet, but the concept, uh, start really around the time period of the Armenian Genocide. Uh, we see uh, German, Swiss, European scholars uh, uh, really delving into uh, the atrocities that are happening during the Armenian Genocide. Um, and are starting to kind of describe that state-sponsored murder of a group of people. Um, and um, so at this point, the, the word genocide is not being used yet, but the, the term is being discussed. And uh, so that starts in about, you know, 1912, 1915, and really towards uh, the end of World War I, we are going to see that that discussion is uh, coming more prevalent. Uh, one of the those scholars that is going to be discussing that is going to be Raphael Lemkin, and I want you to keep his name in mind as it's going to come back uh, because he's actually eventually going to coin the term genocide. Um, 
then uh, after the Armenian genocide, we have another large genocide right after that that is actually uh, narrated in our exhibit as well, which is the Holodomor. It is the starvation of millions of Ukrainian peasants and Ukrainians uh, by the Soviet regime to put down Ukrainian nationalism. Um, uh, so that continues that discussion of what what is that when uh, a state is or or, or a, a dominant group is really trying to target a minority group uh, and trying to literally wipe them out. Of course, it's World War II and the Holocaust that is really going to bring that discussion to the forefront. Um, it is going to be at the Nuremberg trials after uh, the war that really the concept legally is starting to go have a little bit more formation. Uh, during uh, World War II and um, after the Holocaust, uh, Raphael Lemkin is going to take all that insight, all of that research, and is actually going to uh, coin the term genocide as um, the systematic murder of a group of people. And um, uh, for the first time, we're going to see that term appear uh, in the notes of the International Military Tribunal and at some of the other Nuremberg trials, we are going to see the term actually appear. Uh, because uh, the, especially during the International Military Tribunals, one of the charges is conspiracy, is the planning of the atrocities. Uh, and with that, this is really where we see legally the forefront of the development of the concept of genocide. And that is really new. Uh, now we have kind of stepped out of the academic framework and now into the legal framework as well uh, during the Nuremberg trials. And I put on here on my slide also the uh, Declaration of Human Rights, uh, because hand in hand with the development of the concept of human rights, is also our more modern concept and development of human rights as well. So that concept of genocide and the modern notion of human rights kind of come together. And it is for no, it's no coincidence that in 1948, then the United Nation is gonna be working on the Declaration of Human Rights, but also the Genocide Convention. And this Genocide Convention becomes the framework that officially is in, uh, in, the, in the international community is going to define what the concept of genocide is and uh, lay some legal basis that eventually the International Criminal Court can act upon on what the standards would be for prosecuting the cr uh, crime of genocide. Um, uh, but of course, that's all good and well. We know that uh, by defining and putting legal parameters on the crime of genocide, that doesn't mean that perpetrators will stop committing genocide. Uh, because after the Genocide Convention, of course, there's many other genocides that we have seen since then. We have had Cambodia, uh, Bosnia, uh, with ethnic cleansing, Rwanda, uh, and uh, other uh, genocides uh, since, since then have happened. Uh, that fit that legal definition uh, set in the Genocide Convention. So the Genocide Convention, and this is a short wrap up because this document is much longer. Uh, actually the full title, we all call it a Genocide Convention, but the full title is really the Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide. And it defines genocide as any of the following acts committed with the intent to destroy, in whole, in part, a national, ethnical, racial, religious group as such, the killing of members of the group, causing serious bodily or mental harm to members of the group, deliberately inflicting on the group conditions of life calculated to bring about its physical destruction, in whole or in part, imposing measures intended to prevent births within the group, and forcefully transferring children of a group to another group. Um, uh, and then uh, the convention also lays out the parameters for punishment of genocide that could be applied into an international criminal, in the International Criminal Court. Now, part of the title here is prevention. And uh, that is as a museum where it becomes a little bit part is uh, creating an exhibit on the convention and um, talking about prevention makes the convention really part because Technically, for the convention to enact uh, 
really it is through the punishment phase is genocide has to happen. The only prevention element in there is, is the defining of what genocide is. But most of what the convention does is actually the punishment side. It is not so much the prevention side. And this has been the struggle in academic worlds in the academic world for quite a while, uh, since really the establishment of the convention is how uh, do we more stress the prevention part? Does the convention truly um, focus on that? So um, the big question in all of this is how do we prevent, right? Uh, we really don't want to enact a convention. It is more how do we enact a uh, convention in the sense of the prevention element. And this is where the model of the 10 stages fits in. Um, it is very much an awareness tool and much more a prevention tool uh, than it is anything else. And uh, that's what I wanted to, we'll just be discussing with you today about the 10 stages. Uh, does anybody have any questions so far about the uh, uh, concept of genocide uh, and it kind of in its historical um, one. Uh, yes, Tracy just asked a uh, transferring of children with the policy of moving American, uh, uh, Indian, uh, Indian American children uh, to residential schools fall under this point of genocide. Yes, uh, the, uh, that could, the transferring of children uh, could in some terms uh, fit within that um, uh, but it needs to be with the intent, right, is the first part of the definition needs to be with the intent to destroy in whole or in part the group. So that is always first. And so uh, for the uh, convention to be used as a, as, a, as a punishment tool and to enact uh, a claim of genocide, the first line needs to be in place. There needs to be an intent to destroy in whole or in part a group. Uh, so the, the intent word is a big part of that. So that's what you need to be able to prove is that there is an intent to destroy and whole or apart a group. So it's not just about the forcible transferring of children of the group to another group. It's also with the intent to destroy that group. Uh, and that is what makes a genocide very difficult to prove that it has happened and opens it up uh, to possibilities uh, of people arguing against that. So uh, the 10 stages of genocide uh, were developed by uh, Dr. Gregory Stanton, uh, who was a research uh, professor at the George Mason University. He is also the founder of Genocide Watch. Uh, and I really recommend if you've never been to uh, Genocide Watch to uh, their homepage to really explore it. Um, they go much more beyond us uh, as just an educational tool. They are fully an awareness tool as well. Uh, they have a watch list on certain countries where they are with, on the 10 stages. Uh, and uh, they look at current day events as well. Uh, whereas we are uh, mainly historical museums, so we use the 10 stages as kind of looking back at history and being aware that uh, uh, the 10 stages are, are a tool for us to be aware in the world of how genocide is evolving. Um, so uh, uh, that is a great resource for you to go to and learn beyond this lecture a little bit more about the 10 stages. Um, uh, sorry, I want to go back just one second. So uh, Dr. Stanton uh, really saw that the, the, the need of more of creating an awareness tool. Uh, he had at that point been very involved in genocide studies, was uh, one of the leading professors in this field, and uh, he understood the, the hole that the convention met of, uh, left of creating some kind of system of how we could really understand this process of genocide and see signs uh, that could show us uh, how uh, a nation or an area of the world could be moving towards genocide rather than saying, oh, genocide is happening. Let's find a tool of seeing how is a nation or an area of the world moving towards uh, genocide. And this became the 10 stages of genocide. To be make it very clear to you, the 10 stages of genocide is an educational model. 
Um, it is created for us to understand the process of genocide, and it is an awareness tool. First of all, what the 10 stages to get her form is the full process of genocide, which is not just extermination. It is the full um, uh, process from the very beginning to really after the big act of murder, uh, because genocide is not just consisting of the act of murder itself. It has uh, different phases and stages in it uh, that together form that whole process. And it is very important for us to recognize that genocide is not just as the convention does it, this very singular act of the intent to destroy and the destruction itself, but the whole uh, process of it itself. So that is really the first step that the 10 stages does, is breaking down the whole process in these stages so that we can understand how it works. Uh, and if we look at that process through the 10 stages, we can see that clear breakout, these 10 markers that make up the whole process. And I'm gonna go through each one of these markers in just a second. The other part to understand about the 10 stages is that they are not linear. Um, genocide is a very, very messy process. Um, I, I always talk to the students and I explain it's like this, this, this almost illness uh, and I, I guess in this time, it's kind of a, a strange uh, way to explain it, but it's kind of like a flu. You, you feel the symptoms coming, you know you're ill, uh, but you kind of maybe ignore it. You shove it to the back. You know something's wrong, but you shove it in the back. Maybe you take some you know, painkillers over the counter to reduce the fever or something that you might be having. So it drops kind of back down and it goes back into the background. But then since you're still ill, it comes back and it spikes and, and you say, oh, I'll take a little bit more and I'll push it back down again. And then it comes back. Uh, and that's what we see is a lot of time with the stages as they do this almost, I call it, the, uh, this is shows that we're from Texas here, uh, this Texas two-step. A lot of times the stages uh, go in ebb and flow and they move in groups of two. What is very important to understand is that the earlier stages that we'll see just as classification and symbolization usually precedes, precede the other stages, but a lot of times they clump together. And just because another stage enters the process of genocide does not mean the previous stages are leaving. So a lot of times they all bundle up together. Um, and, and move forward together rather than one stage happens and then another stage like this nice chronology. That is just not how uh, genocide works. You can't put a pretty pattern on it. The closest what we do have is this 10 stages, this 10 markers to recognize that we might be on that path uh, to, uh, towards the actual extermination, towards the actual murder within the process of genocide. A lot of times these stages are predictable. Once one has happened, uh, this is where the awareness tools come in, the prevention is. When we see that certain markers are present in that process of genocide, we know that quite frequently the other markers will follow after that. So we know we can kind of predict what will be coming ahead. Now, prediction doesn't mean that the stages are inevitable. We can stop it. That is the whole purpose of the 10 stages, is to understand that a society is moving towards uh, the actual extermination uh, marker uh, and to that stage, but that we can stop it, we can prevent it. Um, we, we can, there's all kinds of actions taken. And that this is where really Genocide Watch steps in as well, and other organizations, Genocide Studies Awareness organizations as well, that then can step in, uh, or government actions can be taken. This is why the 10 stages is such a popular tool. Many of our state departments use the 10 stages. Uh, it is often uh, looked upon by the United Nations and many academic organizations uh, and universities use this system as an awareness tool. Um, so it is only more in recent history uh, that this has also become a, much more a public tool as well and that we are seeing it pop up uh, in more educational tools for secondary schools and of course in museums like ours. So 
Um, I'm going to go to the chat before I move forward. I'm actually going to go into uh, the stages. Uh, I am going to check really quick uh, the questions here as well. Um, uh, Deanna, um, uh, on um, the uh, American Indian population, um, the intent really depends from um, tribe to tribe and nation to nation. Uh, so uh, uh, it is very difficult to pinpoint for all of them the exact intent. Um, and do be aware, um, that is what the 10 stages are great for, is we can see immense um, dehumanization and persecution and we're going to look at all of these stages but that doesn't mean necessarily in all of these historical events we could put many historical events as examples on the 10 stages they do not lead to extermination um, so uh, that is something to keep in mind as well the 10 stages are also a great tool to look at the process even when a genocide has not uh, historically occurred and to have a better understanding of what happened and maybe not always use that label of genocide as well, but still understand that the process was in place. Um, uh, uh, and, and, um, as, uh, Brenton asked about um, in the COVID age of reference to, uh, uh, you know, high profile people warning that this is a genocide against older people. Again, um, that would not fit the definition, uh, the UN definition of uh, genocide. Uh, again, there could be discrimination happening here. We'll look at some of these stages, but again, there is no intent here uh, or no plan in place. Uh, to wipe out uh, the global elderly population at this point is just not in place. So that is very important to understand about the definition of genocide um, in that case. But we could see there might be some classification and symbolization already happening. This is, again, why we look at the process rather than the act itself through the 10 stages. Okay, uh, any other questions about the structure of the 10 stages? Does this make sense to everybody? Uh, before I'm gonna actually go into them one by one. Okay, um, so what I'm going to do is I'm gonna go stage by stage. Uh, I um, laid them out in the order that they were developed by Dr. Stanson, but remember, as we're going through these, these are not linear, so we can flip these around. You'll see if we would look at, um, now just to take one, um, genocide, the Holocaust, uh, sometimes um, um, uh, the, uh, when in one area uh, of Europe, uh, the Holocaust, the stages will come up very different um, in their pattern than in another case. For example, in Poland, it is the, you know, the, the pattern of the stages and the process of genocide is very different than the process in France. Uh, so even within, a, within one genocide, that process can appear very differently. But for just as explanation matter, we're going to go through them the way they are, in, uh, are laid out by Dr. Stanton. But just keep that in the back of your mind as we're going through it, that again, they do not need to be linear. Um, and also thing to keep in mind again, as I mentioned, at each stage, technically, we can stop this process. It is always preventable. So keep that in mind, especially at these earlier ones, right? Um, so the first uh, stage I wanted to discuss is classification. Uh, it is the, uh, defined as all cultures have categories to distinguish people into us and them. Uh, this can be by ethnicity, race, religion, nationality. There's many other groupings, right? These are just examples. Um, uh, uh, so, um, uh, but it is creating a difference between one group and another group. Uh, a dominant group and usually a more uh, a, a minority group uh, that uh, happens here. Um, classification exists in most societies. Uh, this classification is really part of the process of genocide when it happens from a hateful, from um, uh, differentiating uh, between two groups, 
by really trying to hurt the other group is so again there needs to be some intent behind it that is when we see classification existing and again this classification exists in most societies uh, uh, this is one of the first markers right now because it exists in most societies we know that it doesn't need to necessarily turn into genocide into extermination why because we know it exists in most societies but most societies are not committing genocide uh, so that is something to understand with these stages as well. Again, they're awareness tools in that sense. So an example that I want to give you is actually um, on the top here is from the Holocaust. It's probably one of my, uh, I, I think, favorite examples to give to the students. Um, it is um, uh, the uh, an opera by Wagner, you know, famous uh, composer uh, called The Ring uh, des Nibelungen, a very famous opera, by the way. It's still, uh, you know, widely performed uh, across the world. Um, but this opera, uh, Wagner was very anti-Semitic and had a very strong um, ideology about the supremacy of the Aryan race and the in depicting the Jews as the enemy to that Aryan race. And that is the structure of the Ring der Nibelunge. It shows these fair and Aryan gods who are trying to be pulled down and trying to be destroyed by these underling troll-like uh, 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 figures which are representing the Jews. Uh, Wagner had no, he had no intent to hide this, that that was his feeling about that. And Germans knew this in popular culture, uh, this, that when these operas were being performed, when Wagner was, that this was the strong tenet. Uh, this just shows that uh, a lot of times this classification spreads through culture on different ways. This classification doesn't need to necessarily come from a government. Uh, it, it oftentimes is part of the society as well and has been religiously or culturally indoctrinated. Um, so um, that is, is kind of an example of that. Um, uh, the other one example is from the Guatemala genocide is uh, this is uh, the warrior Tekon Unwan, who uh, was a Mayan warrior that uh, fought and united Mayans to fight against the Spanish conquistadors uh, during col uh, colonization of Guatemala, what is today Guatemala. Um, and um, he's always portrayed as this, this strong warrior, very violent, aggressive, so are Mayan gods. Right, uh, because Mayans were seen as uncivilized, warrior-like, dangerous, uh, and does as we see the process of genocide develop, it fit within the pattern that it would be uh, okay for them to link. It would be normal. It would be assumed that it would be okay for them to link with the communist rebels who are against the Guatemala government. Uh, so again, that early classification right here within Guatemalan history as well. Now, does, did that necessarily need to lead to genocide? Absolutely not, right? Uh, and that is one of the, the big things that we need to understand about this process. Uh, and that's why, again, the 10 stages have that awareness tool built into it. Uh, the second one is symbolization. Um, and like I said in the beginning, is a lot of times these stages make kind of a Texas two-step. So a lot of times when you see uh, the, the marker of the stage of classification happen, you'll also see the stage of symbolization happening. Symbolization is that culture gives, cultures give names or symbols uh, to the classifications that they've made. They often distinguish them by colors or dress and apply symbols to the members of the group. Classification and symbolization are universally human and do not necessarily result in genocide unless they lead to dehumanization, which will be one of the next stages that we'll discuss. When combined with hatreds, symbols may be forced upon unwilling members of a pariah group. So it's that more dominant group that might be forcibly now giving symbols as well, 
um, but also usually give symbols to them as, uh, to, to themselves. Um, so it is this us versus them. This is why I say a lot of times these stages uh, connect uh, is uh, the dominant groups oftentimes give them give themselves symbols. Think, think about the swastika, right? Uh, the, the dominant group is says, this is us, this is how, what we look, this is what you're part to be in the in crowd. And the outsiders, the them, uh, they uh, look like this, uh, or we give them a symbol because they are different from us. So a great example from that is the Cambodia genocide. During the Cambodia genocide, the Khmer Rouge uh, really saw themselves as an agrarian, want to introduce that fully agrarian society, rural, uneducated, peasant-like. And so anybody that was an outsider was urban, was educated, was a learned person. So if you were able to read, which was uh, not common in Cambodian society, or if you wore eyeglasses, you were seen as an educated person, you were dangerous, you were an outsider. Now, this is not a symbol that was given, but it was a symbol um, or names or concepts that were given to, so the other group was symbolized by the way that they looked. Now, within the Cambodia genocide, the Vietnamese who were seen as dangerous and was being part of that, uh, especially Vietnamese refugees from the Vietnam War in Cambodia, they were marked and were required to wear the blue chroma. And you can see the lady right here, chroma is a blue scarf. The Khmer Rouge usually wore red colors, but the Vietnamese were marked with the blue color, with the blue chroma. Now that is a forced upon symbol, very similar to the yellow star during the Holocaust. Um, so, um, so that symbolization is using in different ways, is marking a group as different. Uh, does do the classification and symbolization make sense to everybody? Anybody have any questions about that? Again, you can always use the chat box for that. Okay, so we made it through the first two. Uh, let's uh, move to the second two. The second two will be discrimination and dehumanization. Uh, notice that as I'm going through it, I always use the Holocaust because people usually have a better understanding of the history of the Holocaust. I will use that kind of as a framework and, um, um, and um, uh, I will try to uh, introduce one of the historical genocides that we have in our gallery as well, kind of as an example as well and kind of give, give you an, uh, other uh, concepts within historically of that same state. Somebody asked if uh, the, uh, um, only the Vietnamese wore the chroma. And the chroma is a very traditionally worn um, uh, scarf in Cambodia and in that area of uh, Asia. Uh, it's just uh, different colors. The marking was done by the colors. The Khmer Rouge, if you see pictures of them, they usually have more the, the red chroma on. The blue chroma was the marking of the Vietnamese. Yes, uh, I hope everybody, uh, you can look at me or at the screen, whatever you would like, uh, but I will be pointing to some of the images on my share screen as well. So I hope everybody can see my share screen. <laughs> okay, uh, discrimination. Um, so discrimination um, uh, is really now where we see in the legal implementation and the customs evolving within that process of genocide. So discrimination is that, that a dominant group, notice that we've shifted from more society to a dominant group. Um, so in those first two stages, we were really more talking about society in general and the, the process of genocide being present. Now we're really starting to talk about a dominant group, right? Um, a dominant group uses law, custom, and political power to deny the rights of other groups. The powerless group may not be accorded full civil rights or even citizenship. The most clear example, of course, during the Holocaust 
is the Nuremberg Laws. But there's many other laws and passing. Um, you can also even see examples during the Holocaust before laws are passed, the custom is already there. So there are several images of um, people um, humiliating um, Jews who had affairs or were, or were had a relationship with uh, an Aryan person or who, uh, who the Nazis saw as Aryans. Um, and they were put on these parades and, and humiliating signs were put on this even before the Nuremberg laws were passed. So that's why uh, the group uses not only law, but custom as well, right? Uh, but a lot of times the legal discrimination comes with it as well. And so we see the passing such as the Nuremberg laws, which remove all, uh, remove citizenship from the Jews and with that all civil rights, basically. Um, uh, so when in the Holocaust, this is very clear, right? But sometimes it's discrimination. Uh, you know, you gotta, this is why it's important to understand human rights as well and what human and civil rights are uh, to understand this, this marker, this stage of discrimination. Give me an example, given an example from the Bosnian genocide, when the Serbs uh, started discriminating against the Bosnian Muslims, one of the first things that they did is take over radio, so limiting free speech. Uh, they started uh, 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 cutting uh, Bosnian Muslims from uh, uh, professional um, positions uh, and, and all government positions. Uh, and then eventually the United Nations created these safe zones where Bosnian Muslims could flee to in cities like Srebrenica and Sarajevo and in areas like Prejador. Uh, but uh, they couldn't come in and out of those safe zones anymore. They were locked in. A lot of times, the, when, especially when the Serbian army came in as well, uh, their free movement was forbidden uh, by snipers because snipers literally sat on the borders of these safe zones uh, or even within these cities. And if you tried to move, you were literally shot upon with a sniper. So this is limiting the opportunity of free movement. And that's what you can see here is, is a picture in Srebrenica of the safe zone created there and the United Nations blue helmets trying to protect the safe zone. Uh, but any form of free movement, which means you can't flee those areas either, uh, uh, can be a form of discrimination. Now notice that, uh, you know, um, a lot of times symbolization comes into place as well. Uh, for example, in Bosnia, in the, in the state of Prejador, um, uh, Bosnian Muslims were also required to mark their houses with white sheets. They put white sheets over their doors or on top of the roof. They were required to do that, to mark where Bosnian Muslims lived. Uh, so again, the, these, these, these stages you can see start blending together. Um, and these markers pop up uh, throughout the process several times. Dehumanization. Dehumanization is essential to the process of, um, of genocide. It is when one group denies the humanity of another group and members of that minority group or uh, the group whose uh, rights are being violated are, at, are equated with animals, vermins, insects, or disease. Dehumanization is necessary because eventually when we get to persecution and to the acts of murder and extermination, it makes this, it overcomes the normal human revulsion against murder because these are not human beings anymore. They are something else. A lot of times we see dehumanization as uh, equating to uh, an animal or an insect. Um, but do be aware that a lot of times during dehumanization, um, um, uh, we um, can also use terms such as traitor, enemy. Uh, we see that all the time. And those evil connotations are also a form of distancing and dehumanization, right? Is, for example, during the Holocaust, 
children were, Jewish children were also the enemy. Jews were the enemy, right? Uh, Jews were dangerous. Uh, you can see here a cartoon, see the little cartoon? It's a children's book called The Poisonous Mushroom. And the Jew is depicted as this kind of almost evil poisonous mushroom. But so are the little mushrooms, the little Jewlings, right? The little children behind that. So again, it's that, that overcoming. They're not human, human anymore. Uh, but um, a more modern day kind of concept of that is the use of the word infidel, is traitor. Uh, and genocidal terrorism, which is the use of terrorism, not just to disrupt a society, but to actually take out with the intent of taking out a whole or a part of a group of people, um, which is a, is a more newer form of, of terrorism that we are, are seeing uh, in history. Um, is is the the constant use in social media of these are infidels these are the enemy uh, it's okay to murder them uh, because they are not they they are the enemy they are the infidel uh, and that is a form of dehumanization as well is creating that distancing as they are not like us they are different from us uh, um, and you'll see that when we see this, the the stage of um, dehumanization pop up that it usually happens together, which a stage we'll see in just a second. Polarization or uh, or polarization frequently follows that. So these two stages are again very closely connected. So discrimination and dehumanization are really connected, but so is dehumanization is very closely connected to the stage of polarization. Okay, I'm going to take a second again to look at some of the questions here. Um, from the outside of these situations, what can other countries do to try and stop these discriminatory acts uh, against minority groups? The UN troops weren't able to do much either in Bosnia or Rwanda. Um, so um, uh, there's many different steps that, uh, we, that you can take and there's some wonderful great activist organizations out there that do that work. Uh, so I really recommend going to Genocide Watch for that because on their website, they have several tools that governments can take, but individuals can take as well. Uh, and it will explain that a little bit more. Um, Brooke asked, do you recommend any particular sources for more details about uh, the uh, Bosnia, Serbia ethnic cleansing, yet yeah, the Bosnia Ser genocide or the Srebrenica's genocide? Um, uh, I'm going to give you some resources at the end here uh, that you can go to. So one of my final slides and um, uh, in, in a lot of these sources, uh, they have more information about Bosnia as well. Uh, so you can find that there. And the focal point is definitely Srebrenica in that, in the Bosnian genocide for that. Um, anybody have any uh, questions about these first four stages? Okay. The next one is organization. Um, uh, organization, um, so most or, uh, genocide, when genocide is when the process is in place, have some kind of structure. Uh, and usually this is the state or the dominant group who is putting that structure in place. Uh, they do this quite often by creating militias or groups of people by centralizing, the, uh, by, sorry, decentralizing this organization. Um, so that they will not be blamed for it, that the state can in, in the end deny it. Oh, it was this group or did it or uh, that, but uh, also that these militias and these other groups can say, oh, I was just following an order or I was just doing that. Um, and that's where the market, this putting in place of this decentralization and this malicious is what the stage of organization is about. So sometimes that organization is very informal uh, or decentralized, and sometimes it is really the creation of these special army units or militias that are then eventually will be trained and they will be armed, uh, and uh, they start becoming involved in the planning of uh, the genocidal killings. Uh, so it is not the overarching plan is made, and, and the state or the dominant group is putting that in place, but they are starting to prep to build these militias and putting the structure in place. That is really what happens under this, uh, under this stage of organization. So um, during the Holocaust, we have various examples from um, the creation of the SA, 
you know, much more informal to eventually much more formal, the creation of the SS, uh, the creation of the Einsatzgruppe, uh, and these are all these almost party militias to the Nazi party that will eventually become these trained units that will participate in the genocide. But also the bureaucratic structure, uh, uh, a really kind of genocide to look at or historical event to look at is the Great Leap Forward uh, in China where Mao um, uh, wanted to industrialize China and pulled all of its steel pots and pans and all of that and grain out of China, starving millions of Chinese and sending them to prison camps. Um, but there, uh, he decentralized the structure and used the bureaucracy, put a very strong bureaucracy in place that implemented the Great Leap Forward. Uh, and they became the tool. So that organization just being putting that structure in place can take that very decentralized form, uh, very informal, or really kind of the creating of these militias. And that usually happens during the, uh, during the stage of organization. Polarization, I've already mentioned it a couple times. It is now really uh, that groups are being driven apart and the extremists are doing that. Um, even within the dominant group, there are some extremer elements and they are gonna call for this polarization uh, as the hate groups are broadcasting continuous propaganda. Uh, think Goebbels continuously, these, you know, during the Holocaust, these, these speeches, these films, the radio broadcast. Laws, you know, are, are forbidden social interaction. See how polarization also overlaps with discrimination. Um, um, uh, they are using uh, forms of terrorism and, and, and propaganda to target moderates, to intimidate them, to silence those who might step in and protect the victims. Um, uh, and moderates from their own, from the own perpetrator group uh, will be targeted uh, because they, again, are most likely to stop this process. So they, they will get arrested. They will be, might be killed as well in this process. They will basically be shut up. Uh, and that's uh, really where polarization uh, steps in. So I wanted to give you two examples again here. The bottom one is a sign uh, that says Jews are not wanted here uh, that were put in restaurants throughout um, uh, Germany, um, uh, starting very, uh, you know, uh, in 34 and beyond, you saw these signs popping up everywhere in public parks and uh, is, is telling, you know, uh, the public, not only through all this propaganda, but by d these signs as well as like, um, you're either going to adhere to this and you're going to be part of this or you're not. Uh, so you're going to shun the Jews with us or not. And if you don't shun the with us, you can might as well be with the Jews you're either with us or not. And that is really where that driving, driving the wedge uh, and making sure that the victim groups does, does not have any support comes part of the stage of polarization. On top is another example during a different genocide is uh, here the Rwanda genocide against the Tutsis um, is using br radio broadcast. The um, Hutu extremists had a, a, a continuous radio broadcasting going out, calling out names of Tutsis to be murdered, uh, is calling uh, Tutsis cockroaches. Again, that dehumanization, right? That's why I said dehumanization is also interlinked very closely with polarization. Uh, calling this continuously out, this continuous message going out, um, uh, saying, uh, calling out uh, Hutu Ten Commandments, which said that if you protected a Tutsi or you stood up for a Tutsi, that you might you were a traitor as well and you were like a Tutsi. Uh, so again, driving that really clear wedge in between the two groups. Okay, preparation. Uh, preparation is now here when the national or the lead perpetrator group, the big guys, right, they start planning to actually complete the mur murder of the targeted group. So now we're not just putting the structure in place, we're actually making the plan for murder. Uh, they start using euphemisms for their intention, uh, like extermination rather than murder is a great, uh, uh, cleansing, all these different, you know, different euphemisms are starting uh, to be used. 
they start building, uh, extreme building their armies, they buy weapons, they extreme train these troops and militias. And, and now they start changing the message to the public as well uh, uh, that um, uh, indoctrinate the fear uh, in them that it's not just follow us along, but if you are not with us, if we are not going to kill them, if we are not going to go into murder them, they will kill us. It's us versus them. There is you know, this, this genocide becomes disguised as self-defense. And a lot of times we see that in propaganda and we'll see it in denial. So preparation in this case is very closely tied to the stage of denial. Uh, is, is that, is, is starting to say, hey, we must get ready. We must make a plan to kill them because if they, if we won't do it, they will do it and they will wipe us out. Uh, we see this in, um, this rhetoric continuously within the Nazi regime, this continuously calling up, you know, we're doing this to help the German nations, to help the Aryans, because if not, the Jews will destroy us. Building of ghettos, uh, putting the plan in maze, uh, place, making, uh, giving orders out for the Ansatzgruppe, uh, meeting at Wannsee, all of those different things. Another genocide to kind of give that example, which is even more clear, is the Holodomor. Stalin actually gets together with his henchmen, with the other uh, leaders of the Soviet party, and actually has a meeting and said, this is how we're going to do this. We're going to put this system of quotas in place. Then we're going to do this. And anybody who doesn't follow uh, the, these extreme quotas are pulling grain out of this, the Ukraine to starve this, to kill this Ukrainian nationalism, uh, will now um, be sent to prison camps and and we're gonna squish this by literally starving to death and they put in the plan in place uh, so now this is much more top down and the actual full planning during the stage of preparation persecution um persecution is i call this the test phase uh it is during this uh, this stage within the process that the victim group's basic human rights are systematically being abused. We see extrajudicial killings, uh, these test murders, torture, forced displacement, uh, genocidal massacres, not the full actual plan being put in place, but massacres that occur intentionally to destroy part of the group. And during this, during usual the states of persecution, this is when the perpetrators are watching if there's international reaction in the hope uh, that nothing will, that they will kind of condone this, this, this full blow murder, that the full plan can come into action and that they can actually fully wipe out the group. Um, uh, uh, the Einsatzgruppe, right? Uh, uh, the, this testing with the gassing during the Holocaust are examples uh, during the Holocaust when there's no reaction to it, when everybody's going along with that, it moves forward. In, in a sense, you can also see persecution much earlier on with Kristallnacht is this first open attack. You know, the Nazis kind of test like, let, let's see the reaction to it. And then when the world responds very little, they move forward. Uh, so again, this is this up and flow. A lot of times you'll see persecution spike up and then go back. And then they'll, the perpetrator will literally sit back. They'll go to one of those more maybe earlier stages and sit to see what the reaction is. And then they'll come back with a more extreme form of persecution and come back. This is why a lot of times, even with current day genocide, you can see this, the stages going up and down and up and down. It is really because uh, they're at really in a continuous state of stage of persecution where they're testing this nonstop, right? That again, when persecution is happening, doesn't mean these other stages are not happening. They could be happening uh, at the same time. Um, so um, uh, I like to give here to the students a, a case of uh, current day, why persecution is so difficult to wrap our heads around sometimes. A lot of times this stage already gets confused with extermination and people claim, oh, genocide is happening, uh, but the United Nations or nobody's claiming this to be a genocide yet. Um, it's because a lot of organizations that do genocide studies uh, uh, adhere to some steps of when something is actually called uh, the 
even when there's intent, is when it is, becomes a full-blown genocide. A lot of times they look at numbers as well. So um, current perpetrators will try to stay under that number, uh, not, tempt, not tempt the international community too much. So they'll hover in that state of persecution for a long time before we actually get to that full-blown uh, genocide. Uh, so that's why it's so important to study the stage of persecution as much as our next stage, extermination. You know, extermination begins, it quickly becomes the mass killing that we legally define as genocide. Um, we call it here extermination because that's what the perpetrators call it as well. It is really a euphemism. It is extermination to the killers because they do not believe that their victims are fully human. Uh, they feel it is necessary at this point. In total genocides, all members of the targeted groups are murdered at that point. Um, so, of course, I have the gates of Auschwitz with the death camps. We are fully in that full-blown stage of genocide. Um, uh, uh, I put another one historically on there is the um, campaign in Tasmania to wipe out, um, by the British government, to wipe out all Tasmanians. And they kind of did this sweep across uh, the um, island of Tasmania to wipe out all Aboriginal Tasmanians. Uh, the few who survived this will be sent into this uh, on this small island called Flinders Islands, and, uh, and which is almost on a, uh, its own uh, camp there, where most of them will start, die from uh, the horrible conditions that they're living in there. Um, so that's another, it's probably one of the most uh, extreme genocides on record that we have is where the full population is wiped out. The wildlife, everything Tasmanian about Tasmanian is being uh, removed at that point. And, uh, but this is what we, you know, the big events. This is when uh, the uh, International Criminal Court, when the Genocide Convention, when all of that can, can enact, basically. Um, uh, so, um, this is really when the genocide is fully, fully happening and when we really, it is, it is too late. This is why it's so important to really look at all of these other stages, right? Uh, we really shouldn't be talking about genocide. We should be talking about all of these other stages, both historically and contemporary. And that is the goal of the 10 stages, is to not just look, oh, is this a genocide or not, and have to label it but actually really look at the process on how it comes about, uh, because otherwise we cannot prevent. It doesn't stop at extermination. The uh, other stage that happens in here, we can basically start before extermination, and oftentimes does, is denial. Uh, it usually always follows the stage of extermination. It is among the surest indicators that other genocidal massacres might still occur, uh, the perpetrators of, uh, uh, of genocide usually dig up mass graves, they burn the bodies, they cover up the evidence, they intimidate witnesses, uh, they deny that they committed any crimes, and they most always blame the victim. And a lot of times they say uh, that it is the fault of the victim or it was part of war, of a civil war. They were, they were fighting us too. They're, keeping that polarization rhetoric that they've already implemented during that stage and during the stage of planning, they continue that. So that denial already starts there and they continue that beyond the extermination. Um, uh, they block investigation of the crimes and continue to govern until driven from power by force. Uh, and oftentimes they'll flee to, flee to exile after that. Um, so, um, um, you know, um, uh, I have an image here of Action 104 is uh, going to some of the mass, the Nazis going to some of the mass graves and digging them up and covering up the, uh, the any evidence. Uh, they put bones and everything of the bodies back to these grain treasures, just so horrible thought of it alone, um, uh, to destroy any evidence of the mass graves. Uh, below that is from the Armenian genocide, which is still one of the most denied genocides uh, today. Um, uh, and you can see here the sign being held up. Thank you to the United States for rejecting Armenian uh, claims is basically saying is thank you for not, uh, you know, here are our story as victims is 
uh, only listening to the Turkish version of that uh, and what um, of what happened during the Armenian genocide and seeing it more rather than uh, almost a civil war, part of war, rather than um, a genocide. Uh, and, and we continuously um, uh, see that in denial um, as well. Um, so um, Ellen asked, um, uh, I assume with, um, uh, when you meant he, um, uh, was uh, Raphael Lemkin, um, uh, do you mean, uh, Ellen, do you mean as he, Raphael Lincoln, or do you mean Dr. Stanton? I, I'm not sure if I am, if you, Ellen, if you could put your question in again in the chat, then um, I might be uh, able to answer your question better. Um, and um, Hilton asked, do you think uh, that Hitler really was watching to see what the West was doing or reacting? Uh, I don't want to go too much into the history of each one of these genocides, uh, but uh, not just Hitler, but um, usually behind most of these uh, regimes that are in part of the process of genocide, uh, it is not just that one leader, but they usually have a whole infrastructure ready that is looking at the reaction of, their, of the people and uh, um, of the world is how they are reacting to that. We know that about perpetrators today as well, is that they are, they do watch the news. Um, uh, of course, under, during the Holocaust, Goebbels had a whole team that did nothing else but pay attention to what the reactions were of the world. Um, so Deanna asks, uh, what larger purpose is served by committing genocide? For the perpetrator, it is is the removal of the other group. Uh, um, again, it, that's why I'm saying is uh, um, these markers don't always start with the dominant group. They can already be existed in societies, right? This is why we start the process with classification and symbolization. Uh, notice that in those two stages, I was not talking about a dominant group or a perpetrator group. Uh, all society had these basic levels already put in place. And that's what the dominant group uh, then uses um, and, and forms an extreme ideology around that. Um, I'll have to look up on how many countries uh, signed on to the Gen Genocide Convention, but I'm sure you can find that on the United Nations website as well. Um, Um, uh, finally, I wanted to share some resources with you as my time is up. Um, first of all, we have a set of graphic novels that accompanies um, our, um, our, uh, uh, our uh, installations in the exhibit. Uh, it covers some of the genocides that I talked about today. You can go to this link on our webpage or under our educator e resources, you can find a tap as well. And there you'll see the contact information for our museum educator, uh, Clara Robinson. And if you email her, she can give you access, the access codes to the graphic novels. The other one I really recommend is Genocide Watch. Uh, it is one of uh, probably the most active organizations uh, tracking this. Um, also, Eyewitness from the Shoah Foundation has a lot of testimonies, not just from the Holocaust, uh, but also from other genocides. And then the United States Holocaust Museum, its Wexler Center, is their genocide studies program. Um, it uh, actively uh, not only does give, provides historical information, but it is, also has a more activist role uh, that it creates updates on current day genocides as well. And uh, they work closely with the State Department on that. So you can go to their uh, resources on confronting genocide as well. Uh, so those are four great ways to expand upon this and where you can learn more. Uh, the United States Holocaust Museum has many uh, different uh, uh, profiles on some of these genocides, including Bosnia, Darfur, and uh, some more current day ones, such as India as well. So you can find that on uh, the Wexler Center page as well. Uh, anybody have any questions?
Okay, if there is no questions, I thank you for joining us today. I hope this was helpful and gave you a little bit better understanding of the 10 stages of genocide. Uh, I really recommend once the museum comes out of its temporary closure to come visit the 10 stages of genocide gallery. It is really a very unique way to learn more about the 10 stages and about these historical genocides and get a better understanding of uh, how these uh, stages historically have appeared within genocides. Uh, so thank you very much for joining. And uh, remember, we have many more virtual programs coming up uh, connected to genocide studies on uh, Thursday evening. Uh, please join us for uh, a talk by Carl Wilkins, who was one of the rescuers and upstanders during the Rwanda genocide against the Tutsis. Uh, if you've not heard this amazing man speak, I really encourage you uh, to listen to him as well. So you can find all of those programs on our programs page. Um, Spencer is uh, sharing the link right now for the Carl Wilkins program. Uh, and I will also on Thursday at 1 p.m. be doing a lecture on children during the Holocaust and child rescue. Uh, it is actually a, a little bit more uplifting topic uh, uh, in Holocaust history. Uh, so there's many more programs, so make sure to go to our programs page and you can find all of the information about that. Also on our education page, we have plenty of online resources also connected to the 10 stages. Um, and we have some online lessons as well. If you are a teacher, you can bring uh, these lessons to uh, your students as well, uh, even if your school is closed. So thank you for joining us today, and we hope to see you at our other programs.